A liberal MP sided with the Conservatives this week on an opposition motion to repeal all carbon taxes. Mr. McDonald, Avalon. Okay, the Liberal getting all the applause from the Conservatives there is Ken McDonald. He's the MP for the Newfoundland and Labrador riding of Avalon and the only Liberal caucus member to vote with the Conservatives on yesterday's motion. The non-binding motion was defeated. Ken McDonald, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. So you voted with the Conservatives yesterday uh, against the, the Liberal government of which you are a part. Why did you do that? I, I did that because I believe we have to change the way we're approaching the climate change incentive or whatever you want to call it. Uh, I think what we're using right now at this time, at this point in time, is putting a bigger burden on people who are now struggling with a, an affordability crisis, if you want to call it that. Right. Uh, this is particularly acute. You, you represent, you know, CBS, the Conception Bay yeah. South, one of the, the biggest cities in, in the province is the core of your riding. We have a lot of smaller yeah. rural areas as well. Yes. This is really hurting people there who use oil to heat their home yeah. and the market signal pricing is supposed to send. There isn't an option for them there. How much is this hurting your party politically in Newfoundland and Labrador? I think it's hurting them a fair bit. Uh, everywhere I go, people come up to me and say, you know, we're losing uh, faith in the Liberal Party. Uh, they appreciate the fact that I've stood up now twice uh, to do away with a carbon tax or to ask for it to be delayed. Uh, I said to someone earlier today, I said I stand with Premier Fury in trying to get not this done away with as such, but get it delayed till we get past this affordability issue. People are finding it very difficult. I've had people tell me they can't afford to buy groceries, uh, they can't afford to heat their homes. And that's hard to hear from especially seniors who live alone and uh, tell me that they go around their house in the spring and winter time with a blanket wrapped around them because they can't afford the home heating fuel and they can't afford to buy beef or chicken. I mean, that's mm. heart-wrenching when you hear somebody say that to you. And my purpose and the way I voted was to make sure that their voices are heard. Have there been any consequences for you for voting this way? Have you gotten any blowback from the party leadership? No, not at this time. Not at this time. You, you mentioned Premier Fury, um, Andrew Fury, the Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador, the only Liberal Premier out there. Yeah. And he has been dissing himself from the federal Liberal government on this particular issue. All of the Atlantic Premiers are frustrated, but to have the Liberal distancing on this yeah. suggests the seriousness of the political issue that, that you're dealing with. Do you think the party leadership truly grasps the implications of, of this policy on rural Atlantic Canadian seats in particular? I think they're starting to understand it. It was a topic that came up at National Caucus as yep. well, of course. And uh, we had a commitment, I guess, from some of the ministers that they would take a closer look at this to see exactly what they could do. Uh, I'll use the example of uh, Minister Freeland came to me when she was in Newfoundland to meet with Pattern in Argentia. Right. And she told me, she said, I am going to correct this. And you were right. Hmm. And I think she meant I was right on the first vote that I did in the first... Right, because this is the second time you voted yeah. against the government yeah. on this. So, so what does a correction look like, right? Uh, because the Atlantic provinces kind of had their own way of getting around the federal backstop until it became untenable and they sort yes. of ended up signing on. Yeah. So, but what does a correction look like that would satisfy you and, and other I, people? I think a correction that would make the most sense would be to delay it at this point. Look, everybody in Atlantic Canada believes climate change is real. Including delay which me. part, though, Mr. McDonald? The, the, the clean fuel standard? right. okay. standards. Yep. And as well, the tax and the home heating oil. Right. I think if that could be delayed and moved down the road, whether it be four months, six months or a year, that would allow things to settle and see where the affordability issue is at that time. We can't keep adding on to expenses. And, and David, you know that everything in our province comes in by boat and by truck, and they burn fuel, lots of it. And that cost to bring it in is going to be added to every item that gets on a store shelf somewhere. So that is punishing anybody who goes to buy, whether it's a chocolate bar or a tin of carnation milk, yep. uh, anything, any a, a piece of two by four will go up, which will make homes more expensive to build. Right. You're at the edge so, end of the supply chain, yeah, right? literally yeah. at the end of it. And, and I think one of the challenges, because the the Atlantic Premiers got on this early and said this will disproportionately impact uh, rural Atlantic Canadians in particular because you have a lot of a lot of seniors with fixed incomes. They burn oil 
if yeah. the, a lot of the vehicles are, are trucks because that's what you need yes. to, to hunt yeah. and, and get yeah. around in the winter. And there's no public transit and the, the ability to transition to a cleaner fuel source it isn't is, really there. So, no, they, so there's not, no option and, to change, and, right? And I know the, the government is pushing people switching over to heat pumps and whatnot, but many homes, especially the older homes, are not designed for that. Or they're not even they're, worth the value not, of a heat pump. Yeah, the they're, they're, they're not yourself. built to sustain the heat from a heat pump. So I don't think it works for everybody. And with regards to it not being equitable, the same as it is across the country, I was told that in Trois Rivières, Quebec, it we and compared to Newfoundland, the economic impact on people would be three times mm -hmm. as great. And for whatever reason, uh, whether it be Minister Gabot, whether it be the Prime Minister or Cabinet in itself, uh, they think that's all right. This is a national program. So it shouldn't negatively affect Newfoundlanders more than it affects people in Quebec or BC or, or in Ontario, wherever. And the rest of Canada as well, in rural areas, I'm sure, feel in the pinch on it as, as well as okay, everybody else. So the Deputy Prime Minister told you she was going to correct this. Um, yes. We haven't seen anything on that yet. So I guess we have to wait and see exactly what will happen. Yeah. I don't know if you're running again or not. People suggest to me when I go home that maybe you weren't. I don't know if you're decided or not. But what are the consequences for your party in Newfoundland and Labrador in the next election if this isn't addressed? I think they will lose seats. Uh, not just in Newfoundland, not just in Atlantic Canada, but indeed right across the country. If they don't get a grasp on this the way that I think they should, and, and I don't profess to know all the answers or the best policies or the best uh, programs to put in place, but this one is hitting home to everybody I speak to. And it's a grassroots issue, and if, a, if an election were called today, I, I'm not sure if the Liberal Party would actually form the government if an election were called today. I would hope they would, but uh, it may not happen. Could you run for the party again if, if this policy uh, isn't changed? Right now, I'm looking forward to the next election. Will that change in the next month or next two months, next three months? It could. Uh, I, I haven't committed that I'm running the next time, nor have I indicated that I'm not going to run the next time because I want to wait and see where this goes, and that will influence my decision big time. Uh, just as a, a final point, you mentioned uh, Christia Freeland, and she was there recently. Uh, Stephen yeah. Gilbo, obviously, is the point person for your government on this. Yeah. I talked to a lot of people who are politically active in Atlantic Canada, and they say he is a problem in the region, that he's too dogmatic on this and a mm -hmm. flashpoint, and he doesn't get the issues of the region. Is he the right messenger for that part of the country on this? No, he's not. And because he's so entrenched in us, and, and, and I get it, I, I mean, where he came from and, and his whole idea of uh, making a big difference in climate change, but you can't do it all overnight. You can't make it more expensive on people than what they can handle. And that's exactly what's happening right now, is the, the government has to put a lens on us, a rural lens for sake of a better word, and try and come up with a plan that's satisfactory and appealable to people who live in rural. Now, maybe no plan will be appealable to rural, I don't know, mm -hmm. but I think the government has to try. And if they do that, I think they got a chance of uh, moving past it and go on and whatever the polls will be, the polls will be. Liberal MP for Avalon, Ken McDonald, thanks for coming in. Thank you for the opportunity, David.